We're talking about orbit today, but we include adjacent skull base because if a lesion is strictly within the orbit, especially the anterior part, um, those lesions are dealt with predominantly by ophthalmology, but neurosurgery becomes involved if a lesion extends to the adjacent skull base or um, extends through the optic canal or superior orbital fissure or involves the bones surrounding the orbit. So um, we're often asked not only to deal with the orbital part, but also we get called in because of the um, involvement of the adjacent skull base. So that when we look at an orbit, um, neurosurgery tends to become involved if the lesion extends through the optic canal or through the superior orbital fissure or through the adjacent walls from either the sinuses, the frontal, ethmoid, and sphenoid sinus. Uh, lesions can also extend from below and involve the maxillary sinus as well as the orbit, or as in sphenoid ridge meningiomas, they can involve the lateral orbital wall and extend into the orbit. So we often get involved when the adjacent areas as well as the orbit is involved. Lesions in the orbit um, can involve temporal fossa, infratemporal fossa, or here we see V2 pass below the apex of the orbit and extend into pterygopalatine fossa or through the inferior orbital fissure uh, into the orbit. But we'll talk in greater detail about the anatomy within the orbit. But here we're looking at orbit from laterally and uh, lesions can extend through the lateral orbital wall. They can access the orbit through the superior orbital fissure or the optic canal or from the sinus medially or they can pass upward here in the medial part of the inferior orbital fissure and pterygopalatine fossa up through the fissure into the orbital apex. But commonly neurosurgery is involved when not only the orbit is involved, but the adjacent structure. Also, the closer the lesion is to the orbital apex, the more often the neurosurgeon becomes involved in dealing with the pathology. And uh, in looking at orbit, we want to first of all understand the osseous wall of the orbit because we're doing osteotomies that will deliver us to the orbit from above or from medially through the nasal cavity and the sinuses, or laterally through the lateral wall through a lateral orbitotomy, or from inferiorly through the roof of the maxillary sinus, which forms the floor of the orbit. So we'll start out and talk initially about the walls of the orbit and the lesser sphenoid wing forms the posterior part of the roof of the orbit. The greater wing forms uh, a large part of the lateral wall of the orbit. Um, and here's sphenoid sinus here that adjoins the ethmoid forms some of the medial wall of the 
superior orbital fissure um, so that we want to have a good understanding of the an osseous anatomy because it's through the bony walls that we access the orbit. Here we see foramen rotundum through which uh, V2 passes to course in the floor of the orbit. Uh, here is the Vidian canal that transmits the Vidian nerve that uh, eventually provides the parasympathetic outflow for the uh, lacrimal gland in the superolateral orbit. So when we look at the orbital apex, superior orbital fissure, optic canal area, we want to see the surrounding bony anatomy such as the upper part of the greater and anterior part of the lesser wings that contribute to the lateral wall and the roof of the orbit and join the frontal bone here along this yellow area to complete the orbital roof. Laterally, we want to see the zygomatic articulation with a sphenoid that completes the much of the lateral wall of the orbit. And then we have an articulation with the ethmoid bone that forms much of the medial wall of the orbit uh, as providing a group as well as providing a group of air cells uh, through which we can access medial wall of orbit. And then below we have an articulation with the uh, palatine bone that contributes to the formation of the floor of the orbit. Laterally here at the superior lateral part of the orbit we have the lateral edge of the sphenoid ridge and here in this area the terion, where the frontal, parietal, temporal, and sphenoid bone meet here, right at the superolateral part of the orbit. Um, so that we start with sphenoid bone. Um, and it's good as you think of the osseous anatomy to think of the related neural and vascular structures so that here uh, at the medial part of the lesser wing we have the optic canal and then here surrounding the optic nerve and superior orbital fissure we have the annular tendon from which the rectus muscles arise um, and the optic canal can either be, well, most commonly in the superolateral part of the sphenoid sinus, but at times the ethmoid can extend posteriorly and you'll find the optic canal in the posterior part of the ethmoid sinus uh, below here, along the floor of the orbit, we have V2, and below the medial part of the inferior orbital fissure, opening into the fissure, is the pterygopalatine fossa, where we see the anterior end of the Vidian canal and foramen rotundum transmitting V2 that runs along the floor of the orbit. So as we look at osseous anatomy, we always want to have that view of the related neurovascular anatomy. So that we add in the ethmoid now and the lateral wall of the ethmoid forms the orbital plate and here we see uh, 
metal turbinate, and then laterally these ethmoid air cells, and if we get in under the uh, metal turbinate here and open the air cells, we have a route through the nasal cavity and through the lamina propitia, the lateral ethmoid wall, the medial orbital wall, a route into the medial orbit. Um, and here we see the ethmoid from above, but here it articulates and the ethmoid air cells are roofed above by the frontal bone and then laterally in the ethmoid, lateral to the air cells, we see the orbital plate of the ethmoid that forms the medial wall of the orbit through which we can approach it. Just a lateral view of the orbital plate of the ethmoid. Above, it articulates um, with a frontal bone. Posteriorly, it articulates with the lateral part of the sphenoid body. Um, below, it will articulate with a little bit of the palatine bone, and then below with the maxilla, and anteriorly, it will articulate then with a lacrimal bone and the frontal process of the uh, maxilla. But you want to see all of these adjacent relationships. And the ethmoid air cells can be divided into a anterior group and a posterior group. And that division is right at the posterior part of the attachment of, of the metal turbinate to the ethmoid. And if you go through posterior ethmoid, you end up near orbital apex and in the lateral part of sphenoid sinus. If you work through the anterior ethmoid air cells above, you end up along the cribriform plate in the anterior fossa. So here we see the uh, ethmoid bone again. It's really two blocks of bone here connected across the midline by the cribriform plate. And as a part of it, we have the metal turbinate and if you get in lateral to the metal turbinate, you're into the air cells, and then you can open laterally through the medial wall of the orbit to complete one of the types of medial orbitotomy. Um, and roofing the ethmoid air cells above is the uh, hiatus in the frontal bone that forms the orbital roof. And here we fit the um, ethmoid into the ethmoid notch of the frontal bone. And here the uh, upper edge of the orbital plate articulates with the frontal bone and then lateral to that is the orbital roof. And um, then we can complete the lateral wall of the orbit uh, by adding a zygomatic bone, which forms the anterior uh, part of the lateral wall of the orbit. And then below, we have the roof of the maxillary sinus that forms the floor of the orbit. Also, uh, here between maxilla, greater wing of sphenoid, and zygomatic bone, we have inferior orbital fissure, um, which we often open into the lateral part of it. If we're doing a lateral orbitotomy, 
or an orbital zygomatic approach. And then we add in the full maxilla that completes the medial wall and floor or lower part of the orbital rim of the orbit. Um, and then forming part of the floor of the orbit here adjacent the um, ethmoidal plate and the posterior part of the floor formed by the maxilla, we have the orbital process of the palatine bone that forms a small part of the floor of the orbit. So the orbit is made up of seven bones. We have frontal bone in the roof, the lateral wall formed by greater wing of sphenoid and the zygomatic bone, the floor of the orbit formed by the roof of the maxillary sinus, along which we have the infraorbital groove, canal um, here, uh, ending at the infraorbital foramen along which V2 passes. Um, medially, we have here medial part of orbital rim formed by frontal process of maxilla, and then the lacrimal bone that articulates with the anterior edge of the uh, orbital plate of the ethmoid, which articulates above it with a frontal bone along the frontal ethmoid suture, we see the anterior and posterior ethmoidal canals that transmit the anterior and posterior ethmoidal branches of the ophthalmic artery and the anterior and posterior branches of the uh, ethmoidal nerves. Posteriorly, we have the optic canal uh, that passes through the medial part of the lesser wing and the lateral part of the optic canal is formed by the optic strut which extends from the body of the sphenoid to the base of the anterior clinoid. Um, below the ethmoid, we have the articulation here with the maxilla, and then at the posterior inferior edge, we have the part of the orbital floor formed by the orbital process of the palatine bone, uh, and then Along the posterior ethmoid, we have the articulation with the sphenoid body at the anterior edge of the uh, sphenoid sinus in this area. So that you want to see and understand all of these articulations and begin to fit them together with the neuroanatomy so that at the orbital apex we have optic canal, optic strut, anterior clinoid, and superior orbital fissure. And surrounding this area we have the annular tendon. The annular tendon is the circular tendon from which the four rectus muscles arise and that the annular tendon surrounds the optic canal and the central part of the superior orbital fissure. Usually there's a small prominence on the lateral wall of the fissure to which the annular tendon attaches and the tendon has two parts, a, uh, a part through which the optic canal and 
um, the ophthalmic artery pass, and then the lateral part bordering the fissure is the oculomotor foramen through which the nerves entering inside and outside the annular tendon pass so that here we have sphenoid sinus, superior orbital fissure. Here we have the four rectus muscles, the superior rectus, medial rectus, inferior rectus, and lateral rectus, uh, which arise from the annular tendon. And um, the ophthalmic artery and optic nerve pass through the optic canal, but inside the uh, rectus muscles, you have the intraconal area, the oculomotor branches or divisions of the oculomotor nerve superior and inferior division pass along with the abducens nerve. They pass through the annular tendon as does some of the branches of the first trigeminal division, but outside the annular tendon at the orbital apex passes the fourth nerve, the branches of the frontal nerve, the supraorbital and supratrochlear, and then laterally from first division you have lacrimal nerve, and then the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins run outside the annular tendon as they exit the orbit, but further forward in the orbit, these veins come into the intraconal area here between the four rectus muscles. We have here superior division of third nerve that supplies levator and superior rectus, and then passing through the annular tendon, we have the nasal ciliary branch of V1 that passes through the annular tendon while the branches of the frontal and the lacrimal nerve pass outside the annular tendon. And here we see superior and inferior division of third nerve, the um, inferior division supplies the medial rectus, inferior rectus, and inferior oblique muscles, as well as giving rise to the motor parasympathetic root of the ciliary ganglion. Uh, the superior division supplies the levator and superior uh, rectus muscle. So you want to think about the structures that pass through the optic canal and then the group of structures that pass outside the annular tendon plus have an understanding of the structures that pass through the oculomotor foramen part of the annular tendon. Um, so that as you look at the surrounding structures, uh, you want to see the frontal sinus medially, the ethmoid, and then the sphenoid, and then if you remove the orbital roof, you see the periorbita, and inside of this, it's filled with fat, um, and we want to understand the structures passing through that fat and also understand that when we're doing orbital surgery, you want to preserve that fat as much as possible uh, because 
if you lose that fat, then the muscles and nerve become scarred together and the orbit doesn't function very well. So uh, for working in the orbit, one of the innovations of brain surgery, which are self-retaining retractors, become very important in maintaining those surgical planes for surgery while preserving the fat that makes the orbit function as well as it does. But you want to stay, understand each of the walls and the structures by which lesions can invade intracranially from the orbit. Here we see the superior orbital fissure, the optic canal, the sinuses along the medial wall that are a route to the orbit or the lateral orbital wall that provides the route for the lateral orbitotomy. And we want to gain an understanding of these structures. And we want to understand, as we work toward the optic nerve, that there are a group of structures in the orbit that enter the orbit on the lateral wall of the orbit, but then cross medially above the optic nerve and tend to block access to the nerve. And one of these is the trochlear nerve. You can divide the annular tendon here between superior oblique and levator but if you make that incision, you want to preserve uh, trochlear nerve. Also, frontal nerve, with its supraorbital and supratrochlear branches, passes from lateral to medial here in the orbit. And we'll talk about a number of other structures that cross from lateral to medial. Another one is the superior ophthalmic vein that crosses above the optic nerve, as does the ophthalmic artery. And here we're back at the orbital apex. We've divided between the superior and lateral rectus here. You can open the orbital apex from laterally. Here we see the frontal branch of V1 pass to the orbit outside the annular tendon, but the nasal ciliary nerve, the branch of V1, passes through the annular tendon, and it's a number of the, uh, one of the structures that passes above the optic nerve. We see the sixth nerve pass through the annular tendon to the lateral rectus. And here's the lacrimal nerve uh, that passes up to the area of lacrimal gland. Um, so that you want to see all of these structures in relationship to the optic nerve, here's the ophthalmic artery, which in 90% of cases will pass above the optic nerve from lateral to medial, uh, but in about 10 to 15% of cases, you'll find the ophthalmic artery below the nerve. Just another picture, we've divided the annular tendon between the lateral rectus that we've folded. Laterally here, we see the abducens nerve entering that, the nasal ciliary crossing above here, um, the optic nerve, um, as does the frontal branch and the trochlear nerve here. Here we see one of the long ciliary branches that carry sympathetics to the globe. Um, but here we see the inferior division 
of the oculomotor nerve that gives rise to the motor parasympathetic rut of the ciliary ganglion in this area. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But you want to understand the osseous wall as well as the complex anatomy inside the orbit. And um, just when we take off the orbital roof and open the periorbita, the first nerves that we see are trochlear nerve to superior oblique, the frontal branch that gives rise to supratrochlear and uh, supraorbital, and then laterally the lacrimal nerve. And then as we go deeper, we see the superior ophthalmic vein that passes above the optic nerve, and then adjacent it, other structures that pass above the nerve, the nasociliary nerve, and the ophthalmic artery. Here we see another nerve that passes below the optic nerve. What is that nerve? That's the branch of the inferior division that goes to the medial rectus, inferior division of third nerve. Uh, one of the important bits of anatomy, uh, very critical to dealing here at the lateral part of the orbital apex, is the origin of the central retinal artery. And it's commonly the first branch of, of the ophthalmic artery before it crosses above the nerve. And just losing that tiny little branch, just get a little bleeding, a little bipolar, and a tiny artery, and it's lost. and the patient can end up with a blind eye. So it's very important to think about saving the central retinal artery in here below and lateral to the optic nerve along the lateral part of the orbital apex. Here we see this branch to the medial rectus again that passes below the optic nerve to reach the medial rectus, a branch of the inferior division. And here's just a picture of the central retinal artery. The artery enters through the sheath and then passes forward to the globe. As you approach the orbit uh, and working from the optic canal, you can divide the annular tendon medially between the levator and the superior oblique, but you want to preserve the trochlear nerve. Um, and here it's been divided with the trochlear nerve preserved. You can also divide the annular tendon laterally if you're working with a lesion coming through the superior orbital fissure, but to divide the annular tendon laterally between levator and lateral rectus, you want to let the superior ophthalmic vein go laterally. It's quite a large vein, and if you pull it medially with the levator, it blocks access to the orbital apex on the lateral side of the optic nerve. So it's better to let that vein go laterally and let the levator without the vein be retracted medially. Here, once you open between the levator and here, sixth nerve going to lateral rectus, you see the division of the oculomotor into superior and inferior division, those occur below the area of the anterior clinoid. 
here anterior clinoid optic strut. The fourth nerve is passing medially um, and the division is occurring uh, right here below the anterior clinoid. And here we see nasociliary nerve pass through the annular tendon above the optic nerve and um, here we see ciliary ganglion and here's nasal ciliary nerve. Can anyone tell me what nerve that is? That's the sensory root. That's the nerve that carries corneal sensation. It doesn't synapse in the ciliary ganglion, but here's inferior division of three. This is the parasympathetic root, um, the, the motor root of the ciliary ganglion that controls the pupil. Here's just the approach along the medial orbital wall. Here the trochlea of the superior oblique muscle diving in under the superior rectus and attaching to the lateral part of the globe. But here's nasociliary nerve, ophthalmic. Here's lacrimal branch going to lacrimal gland that comes from V1. Uh, how does parasympathetic innervation get to lacrimation. It gets there from vidian nerve that we saw coming through vidian canal to tergopalatine ganglion. It gets into V2 along the floor of the orbit. And then how does, how does it get up here? How does lacrimation get from vidian nerve to uh, the lacrimal gland? From V2, the V2 gives off the zygomatic nerves that innervates some of the skin around the lateral orbit, but it picks up the branches from the pterygopalatine ganglion and the vidian nerve that come up the lateral orbital wall and then someplace near the orbital apex, those parasympathetic branches that get into the zygomatic branch of V2 jump to the lacrimal nerve and then the final pathway for lacrimation then comes through lacrimal nerve but Lacrimation starts back in the facial nerve and the posterior fossa, greater petrosal, to vidian nerve, then to V2, to zygomatic branch of V2, then to V1, to lacrimal nerve. Here's just the view along the lateral orbital wall and lacrimal nerve and you want to see this all in the context of the adjacent structures of middle fossa, branches of V1 entering the orbital apex, V2 running along the lateral orbital floor, and then V3 here entering infratemporal fossa. But as you blow up all of this anatomy, whether there are multiple routes that intracranial pathology can extend to the orbit, out of the sinuses, or along the foramen of the cranial nerves, or along the optic canal um, to the orbit. And you want to understand all of these complex relationships once it gets outside the orbit, the neurosurgeon is the one who's called on to deal with these complex relationships. And then we do just a quick review of 
cavernous sinus behind with third nerve passing below the anterior clinoid. Here, fourth nerve, V1, abducens nerve, here passing through the superior orbital fissure, V2 exiting here, middle fossa to run along the floor of the orbit. Um, and we see the sixth nerve come through Dorello's canal, pass medial to V1, and then at the superior orbital fissure, you see it below V1, um, going to the lateral rectus, while the frontal nerve is turning upward to run across the roof of the orbit. Um, here we've removed the clinoid and just um, under the clinoid here, we see the fourth nerve passing from lateral part of orbital apex to the medial part to innervate the superior oblique we see actually a pneumatized um, optic strut extending toward the anterior clinoid. And here we see the division of the third nerve into superior and inferior division. This taking place below the anterior part of the anterior clinoid. The sixth nerve runs forward from Dorello's canal to the superior orbital fissure on the medial side of V1. Here we see another orbital apex, clinoid removed, optic canal, and then lateral to the optic canal, and we see some of the structures passing through the oculomotor foramen of the annular tendon and other structures passing outside. Here now, we see we've removed the clinoid, the lateral wall of the superior orbital fissure. Here you see the oculomotor foramen and um, the trochlear nerve passing above the orbital apex, frontal nerve passing outside the annular tendon, but sixth nerve and nasociliary nerve passing through the lateral edge of the oculomotor foramen here at the orbital apex. Here we retract the frontal nerve you see the nasociliary nerve, and below it, the sixth nerve going to the lateral rectus, and here the division into superior and inferior divisions of third nerve, and the trochlear nerve passing medially below the anterior part of the anterior clinoid that has been removed. Here we've divided the annular tendon laterally here, and we see superior division of third nerve going to levator superior rectus, inferior division going to inferior rectus, inferior oblique, giving rise also to the motor parasympathetic root of the ciliary ganglion and here we see the sensory rut of the ciliary ganglion that conveys corneal sensation through V1 and some of the branches of nasociliary nerve that carry sympathetic function to the globe. But it's a complicated area, but the annular tendon can be open and for the approaches to roof and lateral wall, if both are involved, you can use this small bone flap that we've shown before that gives access to the orbit.
or along the sylvian fissure. For larger lesions, you can do one-piece orbitozygomatic craniotomy or two-piece or three-piece approaches to this area. Or you can use very small craniotomies of the superior and lateral wall that give access to dura and the periorbita. So you can uh, tailor these approaches from above uh, using a variety of flaps. We want to just look at the orbit a little bit from anteriorly. Here we see the orbicularis oculi and looking into the anterior orbit above here incorporated into the levator is the uh, superior tarsal uh, plate of the eye. Medial and lateral cantal ligament. Uh, we see diving in under the superior rectus, the tendon of the superior oblique, and below we see the attached to the maxilla, the inferior oblique that passes below the inferior rectus to attach near the superior oblique along the lateral part of the globe. As you look into the orbital roof, we see the tendon of the uh, superior oblique anchored here to uh, frontal bone. There's a little dimple in the bone at that point. The supratrochlear uh, superior orbital nerve, the levator superior oblique, and medial and lateral rectus muscles. Uh, here we've elevated the levator. We see the superior rectus, the tendon of the superior oblique, the inferior oblique passing below the inferior rectus, and the lateral and medial rectus muscles. And when you enter the orbit from anteriorly, Attached along the orbital rim is the orbital septum that separates the globe uh, and the orbital fat from the sclera and cornea anteriorly. Just approaches through the lateral wall. Here we're looking at our sphenoid bone from laterally and then we add the zygomatic bone above the frontal bone to complete lateral orbital rim. Behind this, we add a temporal bone. And then at the terion, we add parietal right here at the terion, right there at the junction of the four bones. So, but lateral orbitotomy, um, you always, in doing it, want to be very careful of these branches of the facial nerve that go to frontalis and the um, orbicularis oculi. But you can do it through a lateral sort of canthotomy. Uh, I think a more favored one today is to come through this area and then turn back a little bit on the lateral orbital wall for a lateral orbitotomy. And here we see frontal zygomatic bone um, and then you can do the lateral orbitotomy here along the zygomatic bone and lift up the lateral orbital rim and some of the lateral orbital wall, you can extend this back to lateral to the orbital apex. And here looking in from laterally, we see the lateral rectus, 
inferior rectus. And then this really long nerve that's going forward from the inferior division to the what muscle? Inferior oblique. Inferior oblique that's uh, forward lacrimal nerve above. And one of the things that's happening today is that for getting into anterior part of cavernous sinus, the bone in this area is being removed, but here we just lift up the lateral rectus and we see the central retinal artery here below the nerve. And you can elevate backwards and remove the lateral edge of the superior orbital fissure and then get into the anterior part of cavernous sinus through this approach and work back through this area. Uh, you can divide the annular tendon laterally and have access to anterior cavernous sinus all the way forward into the orbit. Just another quick lateral orbitotomy here and lateral orbital wall removed, lacrimal gland, and then the lateral rectus elevated. And again, in this area, inferolateral below the optic nerve, you have the central retinal artery that is always to be preserved if possible. If lost, it leads to a blind eye. Then you can access the orbit through the maxillary sinus, um, through the floor here, or you can get in through the posterior wall to the pterygopalatine fossa, or you can access foramen rotundum, or work medially into the sphenoid sinus and ethmoids the uh, ethmoidal uh, wall of the orbit is here just above the maxilla so that you can get in through this area, come through the floor and have great access to the floor of the orbit. And um, here you can work through maxillary sinus back to the pterygopalatine fossa, anterior end of Vidian canal, V2 at rotundum, and you can come into the maxillary sinus here from anteriorly, and then work below through the floor of the orbit. This is often used for orbital decompression in graves. And here you see how far the ethmoid air cells extend below the orbit. These are all ethmoid air cells that have been drilled out. So the route through the ethmoid, you can come in through the nose, through the ethmoid, and access medial wall of orbit as well as floor in this area. And then you can get into maxillary sinus and have access to all of this area forward to the inferior oblique muscle. And just a view from below, but we see again the central retinal artery entering the optic nerve from below. And this is a view from below the nerve part of inferior division going under the optic nerve to the medial rectus. And this is one of these uncommon ophthalmic arteries that passes medially below the optic nerve. And you can see the central retinal artery in this area. Uh, here we pull that ophthalmic artery posteriorly and you see the central retinal artery entering 
the lower surface of the optic nerve. And here we see it, the ophthalmic artery, central retinal artery entering the optic sheath and the center of the optic nerve. And then there are a variety of medial maxillotomy approaches that you can access the or orbit. You can just do a, a incision here and work back along the frontal process of the maxilla along the lacrimal bone back to the orbital plate to access medial orbit. You can uh, do a small medial maxillotomy and get into the nasal cavity under the middle turbinate and work through the ethmoid air cells into the medial orbit. Or you can get into the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus, work through the ethmoids and the roof of the maxillary sinus to the medial orbit. So you have medially then, you can get under the middle turbinate, work through the ethmoids, you can come through the maxillary sinus or just a small incision, a sort of medial cathotomy approach back to the orbital apex. But um, using these routes through maxilla, through the ethmoids, through the lateral sphenoid, through the nasal cavity, you can access all of this area. Here we see the orbital apex adjacent the annular tendon, but coming through the sinuses medially, you have access to all of this area. And just the view as you work through the nasal cavity, inferior metal superior turbinate, we remove metal and superior turbinate and open the ethmoid air cells in the lateral wall of the nasal cavity and you're up to the lamina papricia here, uh, the ethmoidal medial wall of the orbit and here the periorbita medially and using the approaches through nasal cavity through ethmoid, roof of maxillary sinus, you have fairly wide access to the floor and lateral wall of the orbit so that you get in under the middle turbinate um, and remove ethmoid air cells and it delivers you up here to medial wall of orbit near the orbital apex. You can access some of cavernous sinus here behind the orbital apex, but that medial wall below the orbital plate is formed by maxilla. Here's the natural hiatus in the medial wall of the maxillary sinus that is filled in by this part of the inferior turbinate and uh, also by some of the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone to close the maxillary hiatus. But here's the part of the, um, the palatine bone, the orbital process that forms the posterior medial part of the orbital floor, and behind that is the sphenopalatine foramen through which the branches of the maxillary artery enter the nasal cavity that uh, provide the vascularity for the uh, nasal septal flaps that we use to close skull base. But here's just maxilla, palatine bone, uh, the hiatus that's closed in by palatine bone, by inferior turbinate, and then attached along all of this area 
is the orbital plate of the ethmoid. So you can work lateral to the metal turbinate through the ethmoids. And when you work through the ethmoids, why you expose all of this orbital plate below the roof of the ethmoids here that's formed by frontal bone that leads to the anterior fossa. But just getting in under the metal turbinate, you have access to all of this medial wall of the orbit. And working through that area, you can access cella, anterior medial wall of cavernous sinus, third nerve, V1, sixth nerve, V2, and right side. Same anatomy on the left side. And then once you work forward through the orbital plate, while you're into the medial orbital wall and can follow all of these structures into the medial orbit, and then sometimes the pathology gets very complicated and you can use a lower maxillotomy from the alveolar process up to the floor of the orbit and combine that then with a frontotemporal craniotomy that gives you access to floor, lateral wall of orbit, cavernous sinus, and V1, V2, V3 uh, that can basically expose all of the anterolateral skull base for very complicated lesions. And from above, you can use uh, bifrontal craniotomy to access complicated lesions that may involve both medial wall of um, both orbits or extend back into the sphenoid sinus. And I've removed chordomas involving all of this area of sinus, medial wall of orbit, and you have intracranial access. Uh, that's an overview of the different walls of the orbit and the intraorbital anatomy. We've studied all of this anatomy to make what is a delicate, faithful, awesome experience for our patients more accurate, gentle, and safe.